Classroom of the Elite Year 2 Volume 3. This volume had the start of the much-anticipated Special Island Exam, and more importantly showcased the entrance of Nanase into Horny Koji's Tool Harem. I think the critical moment in this volume was when Ayankoji saw Nanase in the swimsuit, and then and there decided that he wants that young tool in his front pocket. The rest is history. So this time we got a monologue of Nanase which didn't make much sense until having read the whole volume. Before that it was just how the way she addressed herself, that really struck out. Nanase basically acted like she had split personality, while in reality she didn't and just used that excuse of having someone else's personality to strengthen her resolve to carry out her tasks that were a bit, morally wrong. In anime terms, it's not really as confusing as some people might think. I would go into it more deeply near the end of the video, because right now we gotta get the small stuff out of the way first. And speaking about the small stuff, we got another usual cliché event with Ibuki. Just like in the earlier volumes, Ibuki's loner status and plot circumstances made her forcibly sit alongside, her hated enemy Ayankoji. Not gonna lie, I don't really mind how many of these exact same events we get with Ibuki, I would still like all of them. Just like the fact that I do like the latest interaction between Ayankoji and Harada. It's a bit of a guilty pleasure of mine. To see Ayankoji talking in a strong town towards Harada, who has gone from, I was like Ayankoji-kun before, to, I have seen the hidden side and most importantly, the T-Rex, this man is more amazing than anyone ever was. Quote. Then with the small interactions out of the way, there comes the class of English teacher, explaining the rules. Which are exponentially more difficult than any of re-exams that have been held before. It's not the most difficult thing to understand, but it comes with much hassle. And if that was not enough, there was Sukushiro openly talking about sexual assault. I have to say the reaction was a bit too much when it was mentioned, but then again I can see just kids flying out of the handle whenever sex is mentioned, quite sad I might say. And then after making sure to mention sexual assault, Sukushiro went on to publicly dominate the English teacher. He made sure to make his power known and let everyone in school know who was in charge, I can just imagine him smiling that creepy smile, calling Mishima Sensei an exhibitionist for continuing to expose him. And after hearing all that Ishizaki was brought to his knees, due to the excess of water. A scream resounded the hall as Ishizaki tried his best to not let his water break. Now basically, the smart ones had understood what they wanted from the rules laid out before them, they laid their strategy, bought what they needed to bring and then embarked on the island. Our boy Ayankoji, cool as a cucumber like usual made sure to take his sweet time and made sure to let us know how the people embarked in this island. Firstly there is Horikita who we only saw at the starting line in this volume. What else she did? God knows. But in her short stories she did talk about her newfound feelings which leads to the question, will this long introduced chick finally join the Hornikuji's harem? Let me tell you the answer to that, maybe, I don't know, but what I do want to say about that is, it would be a whole lot better if Horikita remains an asexual pre-puberty chick. Do I ship her with a Yonkoji? Not really, but I can see many people shipping then because of the anime, and I have to admit I also would have liked them to end up together when I first watched the anime. After reading the light novel, not so much. But it's not about just me being based or not liking it. For the story-wise it would be better if not all the girls who come in contact with Ayankoji falls in love with him, even Harem needs some limits. Plus Horikita can just kind of have a rivalry with him, or just get used by him. It depends on how smart she became with all the character development tossed her way by her brother. But at least here, Horikita decides that Ayankoji can well past take care of himself and that she needs to do well on her own end to earn his acknowledgement. Then there is the solo going Ibuki who approached Horikita and shouted that she would not lose while glaring at her. I thought she might also say something to Ayankoji to but then again, she knows about Ayankoji's monstrous ability, so it really would have not meant anything if she said that she would not lose to him. And on the topic of who might not lose to Ayankoji, there is Kuenji who was briefly discussed among Horikita and Ayankoji. Horikita had made a bet with Kuenji C that he would perform to his fullest but it's not really surprising that anyone from class D would have some misgivings. But fortunately for them Kuenji did perform to his fullest, he just ground pounded every competition he came across, becoming one of the top five and quite a big target for the child crusher, Nagumo. Although the only detailed competition we saw of him was with Ayankoji which was quite anticlimactic. It was basically the cliché, he didn't use his power, and neither did the other person. But Kuenji is freakishly strong. 
enough to enter a stalemate with a not serious Ayankoji in grip strength. Plus in the previous volumes we have seen signs that he is skilled, how he was immediately able to perfectly enter the meditation state in volume 9. Now the person who was most annoyed by Kuenji in this volume was Nagumo. Nagumo about how much of an oddity he was and although everyone knew he had a secret big brain plan incoming, it has to be said that he must have been annoyed by seeing Kuenji's name so far up the scoreboard and him just, using his Tarzan skill to arrive first and claim the entry to all the exams. Then in the third year there is Kuyuan who talked a bit with Ayankoji in the beginning, and she still seems like she wants to do whatever she pleases, let it be acing some particular exams or annoying the already beaten up, Kiriyama to death by not contributing anything towards the class. And now let's get down and about to the spices. Mainly in this volume that's Nanase, who is off parading around the whole island with Ayankoji, a proposition she had made, I might add, very casually. A proposition that was accepted by Ayankoji, I might add, very casually. Onto their little bizarre adventure, they met up with the new idiot trio, Sudo, Ike and a very side dish, side character. And that, in all seriousness, where the genius from the white room, Ayankoji Kiyotaka lost for the first time in true sense. As it turns out Ayankoji's fatal weakness is his lack of knowledge about the culture. As it turns out Ayankoji isn't in fact, a man of culture. A truly sad fact in fact. Something a bit more sadder was Ike's heartbreak. With all due respect, Ike truly brought it upon himself with not treating the girl he liked, Shinohara, right. He had the gals to chase after Kushida's skirt while he was planning to propose to Shinohara. But still everyone can relate with, a sad boy. And sometimes you just gotta blame the hormones you know. But Ike was taking it very hard. He was jealous, depressed and angry with himself, and Nanase did hammer that fact into him. Others tried to cheer him up. His friends like Sudo tried to do so in their own caveman way, while Ayankoji just watched and made mental monologues about human behavior. And in that moment Nanase reached out to him, obviously protecting her own emotions onto him, talking about giving his all, not half asking shit or he would regret it. Those words, spoken from anguish and experience, truly reached Ike's heart. In fact it was the first time that I had a very favorable impression of Nanase. This scenes was her genuinely showing a true side to her and truly, in all sense, actually helping out. Everybody was grateful for that. And then later on we did get a development on the whole situation surrounding Shinohara and Ike. The mystery assault, the weird hair colored culprit. Basically Shinohara's team got pushed off the cliff. Literally. And Shinohara kind of got quite a bit scared of the culprit and all the weird things happening around her. Anyway onto the main point, Ayankoji managed to come across the scene with the watch alarm going off. He called onto everyone and they did reach the point. And we all know what happened after that. The main thing here is the fact that, Ayankoji briefly did mention noticing someone in the bushes but not going after her. He even said that the one hiding behind the bush was making her presence known to him. That person was later chased by Nanase who after giving Q chase after the Tarzan-like figure, saw the weird hair and stopped short. Of course we later found that shit out so there isn't that much of a deep mystery on it. What did happen was that in a twist of the plot, Shinohara and Ike were giving the special exam together, and to be honest at the end of the day that's all that matters. I don't freaking care if some kids from class B got hurt. Just let the ship sail. Then afterwards we go from that to Nance slowly but surely hitting her limit and realizing the gap between her and Ayankoji. Although she did promise him in the beginning, very confidently, that she would not hold him back. She kind of did. Not really, affecting any chances of Ayankoji winning mind you, cause I know Ayankoji's aim was to get a new tool. But still he could have traveled faster without her. And she realized that. And when in that moment she still recklessly pushed herself forward to match up with him Ayankoji offered his hands, making complicated emotions rise out of her. And let's just cut to the chase here. Nanase was the childhood friend of the son of the butler who served Ayankoji, who regrettably had committed suicide. She felt for him, I don't know if it was brotherly love or something more romantic, it doesn't even feel right to dig that up, but she did love him. And her aim wasn't Ayankoji's defeat but rather her getting an apology out of his dad, who basically was like the Thanos to her Wanda. Ayankoji's defeat was just W stepping stone for Nanase, quite cheeky I might have said if it weren't for the serious circumstances surrounding her. Then the king awaited fight took place. Nanase versus Ayankoji and Ayankoji didn't hit her once, cleverly dodging any accusations of hitting a woman. 
And Nanase collapsed in her defeat, an outcome we all know. And that was when Ayankoji offered her, his oh so ever kind hand. Of course internally he was calling her an ant, a trash and a tool that he would try to use. Unlike his father who just throws such things away. For both of them everyone are, things not people. And then the tool harem was increased. Just as this fight took place another cat fight was taking place. Although it was more of a beatdown. Let's start from the beginning. First of all there was the secret meeting between the first year which had been arranged beforehand. People from Classic were expected but they didn't take part, because Hosen is a salty short-tempered bastard. But this meeting was spicy and violent enough without Hosen being there. The lollipop girl was more than she seemed to be. She ordered Utomiya and Yagami was manhandled, and the truth about the Kushida was forced out of him. Showcasing the obvious truth that Yagami wasn't a cute freaking kahai. Of course there is the possibility that Yagami planned for that to happen and if he truly is the white room student he just let Yutomiya manhandle him because, a white room student can easily beat a student to a pulp. Anyway Yagami's plan with Kushida and Kushida's secret came to light. And the Kushida who had been backed into the corner, had to follow Yagami's instructions so she ran towards the spot where Ayankoji and Nanase would sight so that she could record it and have Ayankoji expelled. Kushida when she was making her way through the tough terrain talked about how she should have known that Ayankoji was someone who needed to dealt with more cleverness than Horikita. I mean oh man, of all the people she should have known that fact. She directly heard from Ryuin about the existence of, X, who was the secret mastermind and making the moves behind the scenes, and it was him, the, X, who was coming up with the winning strategy, not Horikita. But she still paid more attention to freaking Horikita and not to the mysterious mastermind, X. She truthfully deserved that beatdown that came her way, both for her horrendous personality and for her stupidity and her not needed Horikita obsession. So Amasawa basically bitch slapped Kushida. A lot. Had her doing backflips from the strength of her slaps. Went full on Psycho too. Smiling down at the ever so stubborn Kushida. Talking about real or fake, the circumstances, and how Kushida couldn't do shit to her, not even complain to someone. This volume had its crazy parts all right. But surely the most heartwarming was the kiss that was shared between Kurosawa and Ayankoji. The Tsunere traits were ever so enjoying to read and by god I love that ship. Not really much to analyze in a kiss, that's a bit too creepy. Then there is Ryuin and Katsuragi, fishing together merrily. The recently freed Katsuragi sure is enjoying his time freely, but of course Ryuin intends to spice things up quite a bit. But here the one with the proposal came Ayankoji. He discussed some secret plan with Sakyongi and Ryuin. I don't know the frick Katsuragi thought about that. Cause he just was not part of that conversation. As for the conversation with Sakyongi it went all the well. Sakyongi longed for it, ached for it. The lily always wants just a bit of this and that. And then in the last part there is just a little in this volume to talk about Nagumo and Kiriyama. Kiriyama has taken his last stand. Nagumo is enjoying the beach with the girls, the only time I know that a character's thought or lewd towards the swimsuit and I don't like it. Mainly the battle with Nagumo will be in the next volume. By this time we just know that here is someone standing behind Ayanakoji with a stick in her hand and quite obviously. Ayanakoji is not gonna get totaled by that, he is just too good at reading auras man that's monotonous character always excel at. Now let's talk about the stuff related to Ichinos and her class. Her class seems to have divided a bit, although some like the people who met up with Ayankoji and Nanase, are still seemingly on the side of teamwork and power of friendship. I think Kanzaki has had enough of that stuff. He is doing his own thing, I think. Then there are the people from her class who met up with Ayankoji and Nanase and invited them for dinner. Where we learn something about their strategy and also that Ikinos' crush for Ayankoji is quite obvious and known throughout her class. And then there is Ichinos herself who has a knack of becoming the target of the worst people out there. She overhead the talk between the first year teacher of class D and Sukashiro and, boy did things get dangerous. When she was ultimately caught and when the 16 years old was on her knees in front of two creepy adults. One adult did talk about disposing her off. I don't even know how they could have got away with that. I mean if something happened to her the staff would take the blame, for having made such a dangerous exam that cost a student's life. Especially in a school which is run solely upon the large amount of taxpayers' money. For argument's sake Sukashiro and the others could have escaped the responsibility by throwing the blame on someone else, but it wouldn't have been pretty. It was quite the ridiculous proposition. But anyways nothing happened to the vulnerable Ichinos and all she did was get threatened by a full-grown adult who also held the most power in the school. 
Not a good look for her in her class. In a way she has to chose between her class and Ayankoji. And the next time I think for sure we would see how well Ayankoji's tool love magic has worked on Ichinos. I think the answer is pretty obvious though. It's in Ikinos's personality to help. I don't think she would just stand by even if it was just someone else. She is kind enough to still lend a helping hand as long as they are in an unfair condition. Oh,